Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad, and today I'm very excited to talk with none other than Roland Chai. He is one of the co-founders of IoTex, which is a very important and up-and-coming IoT-related project. So thank you, Roland, for coming on the channel today. We really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. So obviously you are a co-founder, but behind that you have a lot of experience. And with that experience, you have a PhD uh, in the, the cryptography field. You also have a lot of experience in research, particularly in the science background. You have been the head of crypto, uh, uh, the crypto cri cryptography department. Um, you've done a lot of experience in R&D as well for Uber. You've also been a security engineer for Google, which is really impressive. And most importantly, uh, is that you've had eight years experience in cryptography and also in blockchain industry. So once again, you're very experienced and welcome to the channel. So IOTEX, a very exciting project. You're one of the very important co-founders. It says on the website that you are connecting the physical world block by block, which is really exciting. You are a decentralized network for IoT, as it explains, but perhaps the thing that we want to know most is that you are arguably powered by a privacy-centric blockchain. So that's a lot of information to understand, but I guess the best way to, to understand your project is to ask the why. Why would you do this, and what are the problems, essentially, you're trying to address? Sure, that's a very good question. <clears throat> so basically, the Internet of Things has been rapidly evolved for years, but there is really no uh, clear application. And we keep asking ourselves why, and like we have three reasons. Uh, I think the first one is the cost. The cost of the hardware, the cost of the operation, the cost of the maintenance, there are still too high to make the IoT device to be widely adopted by everyone. Okay. So the second part is non-scalable back backend infrastructure. Uh, because like for big companies, for big IoT players, they have this capability to have like a very cool backend infrastructure. But for like a small IoT vendors, IoT manufacturers, there are a lot of them. They really don't have this capacity to have to build up like the entire backend infrastructure. So that's why the IoT device, the IoT service they have is kind of limited to the functional value. And third but not least is the privacy. Like for now, there is really no privacy built in for like IoT devices, also IoT services. I see. So that's a problem like IoTx trying to attack. I see. So cost and mm -hmm. privacy are, are really key. Could we talk about security as well? It's one of the big things that are addressed both in your white paper and on your website. Why is it that security is also such an issue? Sure. So uh, basically, security have different definitions. One definition is like to measure how vulnerable the individual device could be. Uh, I think that's a part like blockchain would be very helpful. But for another definition, which means like how this system of uh, devices behave entirely, uh, that part uh, blockchain can help because blockchain itself is like a decentralized uh, P2P system. Uh, where it has some built-in tolerance to attacks. Say if like one node has been compromised, the other node will like still function well if like the blockchain is doing the right thing. So I think that's that's a security we are trying to enhance here. I see. So if we could extend that mm -hmm. a little bit more, obviously you broached some concerns about the current models of IoT. Obviously there's a centralized uh, component to this, but you are moving arguably into a decentralized space with blockchain being the underpinning uh, technology. So why the blockchain? Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to, you know, evolving IoT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Like, like, I, like, I, like I mentioned, there are three problems for the IoT right now, which is like cost, uh, the backend infrastructure, and also the, uh, the privacy. Right. I think blockchain technology would be really helpful for this three so it's three, uh, three aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of cost, because blockchain has this fascinating crypto economy, crypto economy, like by extending crypto economy into the IoT world, like our goal is to drive down the cost, drive down the cost of individual devices right. to make them like uh, more uh, massively adopted by everyone. I see. In terms of the backend infrastructure, right? So blockchain itself is like a P2P infrastructure. So uh, if it works, then there's a really no need to build like an individual backend infrastructure for each of the IoT device. I see. So that's two. Uh, last one is a privacy. Like blockchain itself can solve the privacy problem to some degree. For example, uh, like the data is basically scoped on the blockchain rather than giving to like centralized parties. For example, you use, I don't know, like some big players, uh, some stats. Basically, you're giving all your data and control 
to those centralized parties, companies. But if you use blockchain, everything is decentralized. No one owns your data. You own your data by yourself. I see. So ownership of data and yeah. also lowering, lowering costs and cutting out middlemen in many respects as well. As we've heard from many different blockchain project, projects, it's about making it more economical, the IoT industry itself. Utilizing. Right. Okay, that's that's great. If we could talk about some of the stats now of I IoT, obviously it's the main focus mm -hmm. of your project. Uh, let, in in the sense, so just how big is the industry right now, generally, and how what do you see it becoming? You know, as we evolve into these decentralized models, in terms of its magnitude. Yeah. So definitely, we are just at the very beginning at the IoT age. Right. We are really far from like everything is connected. Right. right. So I think there are some reports saying by 2012, there will be 18 billion connected devices over the world. Yeah, I think and it's the 20, market cap. I think it's 20, uh, two, 22. 20, yeah, 2022. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And also, I think uh, the market cap, like their estimation is like a, at least $1 trillion. So right. that's a really huge market. And we're just at the very beginning. Right. So it must be exciting in that respect that you are one of the forefront companies and no doubt you're not so worried that there's other people entering the space because it is so fresh, it is so new. Mm -hmm. Would that be fair to say that you're not so concerned that other people, other companies are also trying to enter the space? Because IoT is a very popular buzzword right now in blockchain. Uh, sure. So actually, this is like a, such a huge problem space. Right. It needs like more power. It more, needs more talent, more money, more companies mm -hmm. like diving into this problem space, trying to solve different problems. I, I, I don't see like them as competitors. I, I think like there, there should be even more projects related to IoT. So basically, they can, we can explore together like a different directions, right. like how to solve this problem. Yeah. And, and Roland, would you argue that having more uh, projects enter into the space would also lead demand into a mass adoption phases? Uh, yes, I think so, like because every project will help this IoT to grow mm -hmm. in maybe one particular way. So yeah, I do see that. Okay, and just in terms of your experience, obviously you are, you are, you are Chinese, you come from a Chinese background, you know the space very well. Um, how is the market looking you know, locally for you in terms of IoT? Um, yeah, region, I grew up in China. Yeah, I grew up in China, but like I went to Canada for my school, mm -hmm. and now I'm at the Silicon Valley. So I really don't know much about China right now. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but at Silicon Valley, I can see like IoT is trying to, trying to like get massively adopted, but still there's a, like a, a long way to go. For example, like I personally have like a few smart speakers, maybe thermostats, cameras, those kind of thing at home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess maybe some uh, area else is similar. Like basically, one home only have like a few IoT devices. I but see. in the future, everything should be IoT. But the, by the sound of it, though, you are very well positioned, given that you are. My apologies, I didn't realize you're in the Silicon Valley, but you are certainly mm -hmm. catering for the West, and also there are certainly people in your team that can cater for the East. So you are essentially really covering your bases. I would, you know, would that be fair to say for the industry itself? Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I repeat the question? Uh, sure. So you're covering your bases in terms of regions in the world. Obviously, many of the projects I talk or speak with or the, the co-founders, they tend to focus on one region to start off. But you don't seem to be doing that. Are you focused more globally with the, the breadth of your team? Yeah, that's very true. Actually. Uh, so IoT, IoT actually is very different from other IoT projects. We are not trying to do this for like a one particular IoT application. Mm -hmm. We are really trying to build out this, like this base layer uh, in terms of blockchain platform for the IoT right. and trying to maybe incubate different IoT applications uh, on top of that. Okay. So, so that's why we are really focused on the base layer. Right. Well, let's talk about that now. Let's get into the tech of it. Now, you want to be a privacy-centric and scalable spinal cord nervous system for the IoT. Let's talk about those two mm -hmm. terms specifically. They are confusing for many. Let's start with privacy-centric. How are you going to achieve that technologically? Um, yeah. So here is a privacy-centric. That means like uh, we won't hide like every transaction that happens on the blockchain, mm -hmm. trying to keep it away from uh, being understood by everyone else. Like blockchain itself provides this uh, thing called pseudo anonymity, mm -hmm. which means like you can see like uh, the transaction maybe has, you can observe like each of the address on the blockchain, like money flows into and flows out of the, this address. Right. But you cannot tie this address to a single person. So that's kind of the privacy look like blockchain provides by itself. 
Right. But we want to like take like one step further, basically trying to hide um, so how's the money flowing, like who's sending the transaction to whom, like we want to hide those as well. I yeah, see. I think there are a few projects already doing that. Like, I think yeah. you're raising a great point because the, the term itself of pseudo anonymity indicates that mm -hmm. it, it wasn't working before and you're trying to redress that and actually make it truly uh, anonymous in that sense. So privacy is genuinely achieved through the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to make like a pseudo anonymity to like a really, really like a anonymity, right? Right. Like everyone should not understand what others are doing. Right. On the blockchain. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about that in the context of your scalable spinal cord nervous system, you know, how is that integral to your system and, and what exactly is it? You mean scalability? Yes, just in terms of, you, you know, you are trying to be scalable with a new, very precise um, algorithm, but, you know, essentially you're trying to build out a nervous system design as well via the scalable, your scalable spinal cord. As it's as it's stated mm -hmm. in your website, so can you tell us a bit more about those two those, that term? Yeah, I think scalability is like a huge topic. Um, I can I can give you like a, some dimensions like we can think through. Mm -hmm. Like one one dimension of a scalability is is a storage, right? Basically, we want to minimize the storage on each of the nodes to make this system more scalable. Right. Because you see, if you see Bitcoin, and Ethereum, like they have really huge store like hundreds of gigabytes has to be stored on the disk in order to make it running, uh, which basically centralize uh, the nodes in a way, especially mm -hmm. in the long run. Which is so ironic. For, for, yeah, which is ironic, right. Mm -hmm. but, so that's why like for, 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 for our stuff, we basically want to minimize the storage. We want, we're trying actually, we're trying to cap the storage at a like constant level. Like okay. no, mat no matter how, like how long this takes to grow, like it will consume, let's say maybe less than 10 gig uh maybe storage I that's see. just an example right okay yeah so that's storage and also in terms of computation and we want to speed up the computation mm -hmm. this also will help to increase the scale scalability so computation comes in different ways like one way that computation has been consumed is like trying to sign the transaction right for each bitcoin right. zero no matter what blockchain you have to sign a transaction to yes. make it legit so that's why we want make this signing like very light in terms of uh, how much crypto operations do we take. Yes. So, so that's, a, that's the thing like we're working on. Right. Especially we were doing this because we, we, we noticed like some of our nodes in the future, they are like IoT devices. They are really weak in terms of computation uh, and uh, maybe memory, right? So that's why we want to make this even signing like to be as lightweight as possible. I see. Yeah, another way, <laughs> Sorry, maybe I, uh, I speak too much. But another way, another dimension of scalability is trying to accommodate more devices into the network mm -hmm. because because uh, like IoT IoT network is so different from the computer network. Like for for example, Bitcoin has like a six thousand seven thousand nodes globally. It's it's not too much. But in terms of IoT, it will it will have like billions of billions of nodes if mm -hmm. if everything goes so well, right? So that's why we have this hierarchical hierarchical uh, architecture just mm -hmm. to tolerate all uh, more nodes into the network. I'm really glad you mentioned that because that was my very next question mm -hmm. actually and I think we need to unpack this is that you do have what's argued as a hierarchically arranged blockchain design but it explains in your white paper that there are multiple blockchains in this hierarchy. So can you tell us about the key point of concurrence, how they concurrently operate to re and also retain interoperability in this design, because it's not just one blockchain design in the hierarchy of your mm -hmm. architecture. Sure, sure. Like I said, like the IoT device, they are like a, has a huge quantity, and also they are different because they're doing different applications. Maybe autonomous vehicle, that like really strong mm -hmm. computing devices, uh, versus maybe some I don't know, maybe some smart water bottle, which is really which could be like really weak in terms of computation, right? So to tolerate this difference, this variety of uh, IoT devices, we have this root chain plus side chain yep. architect. So the idea is basically one type of devices or maybe one application, they will be just running in one side chain. Uh, and that side chain could be designed, maybe parameterized uh, or maybe optimized for that kind of IoT application. Okay. And then we have this root chain, which is as a backbone for all the side chains. Like side chain can talk into another side chain through the root chain. So that's the idea. Basically, it's analogous to internet. So basically, for internet, you have this backbone internet, internet, and also you 
you have this local network. Basically, your network is basically sitting sitting within uh, maybe a home network, mm-hmm. which tries to talk to another uh, computer in another local world uh, network through this backbone. I so see. it's a similar. I see. And in that respect also, it seems that uh, the, the current wave or the new wave for blockchain design is to have a degree of parallel or horizontally scalable uh, elements. And certainly concurrence or concur- uh, concurrently operating blockchain designs are the, the new wave. So can I ask mm-hmm. you, Rowland, why what is the value in doing this? Why split it up into side chains and have the root chain? What, what fundamentally does it do that previous blockchains with their monodimensional approach don't achieve? Is it the computational advantages? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, no, it's actually more than that because we identify like IoT, they have three characteristics. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, the first one is large quantity. And the second one is called heterogeneity. That means like every device is so different, Mm -hmm. right? And also the third one is called like uh, application specific. That means like they are doing really different things. Like cars are picking up people, like a maybe a smart bottle that's just trying to maybe measure how, how much water you drink every day, mm-hmm. for example. So like these three characteristics makes like this hierarchical archi- architecture basically very needed. I see. And what about in terms of scalability? Does it also afford better oh. scalability because of that? Yeah, that's for sure, right? Because you cannot put everything on one network. It just will just blow up that network no right. matter what. How, how, how much TPS you have. Mm-hmm. But you can then you can just separate duties, like each one just do maybe a small portion of work mm-hmm. and for itself, so that will make even storage and also transaction throughput much right. better. So Rel, and what would you say to the generation one and two blockchains that aren't doing that? Obviously haven't. They've been the buzzword for many, you know, for some time now in the in the very volatile crypto space, but certainly they aren't doing side chains, the initial ones. You know, we know they have smart contracts and we know they have a DAP facility, but they certainly aren't doing the kinds of things you're proposing to do. So what mm-hmm. would you say to those, you know, beginning blockchain entities? Yeah, I, I think like uh, every blockchain should uh, just design or maybe optimize for their own verticals. Mm-hmm. Like for example, Ethereum, I, I think it's just like a design for to running like a smart contract on top of that. Right. Like a smart contract wouldn't need to be very efficient. It just needs to be work. To be trustworthy, that's it. Um, it's just like designed for this purpose. The same as IOTEX is designed for the for the IoT space, so that's why it has this like architecture. I see. So you don't feel that they, they those previous previously existent DAP platforms require the kind of scalability and des- an architectural design that you need for IoT? No. No, I don't think so. I think they're different. They're just trying to solve different problems. Okay, that's interesting. If we could talk about now interoperability as well, how are you going to achieve interoperability with other blockchains? Is it just with your own side chains, or are you planning on spreading that to other IoT-related blockchain projects? Uh, I think for now the plan is just to try to accommodate all the side chains within the IoTex network. Okay. Uh, if we're going to accommodate with other blockchains, I think they're like there will be some like huge amount of work okay. down the road. There are there are some projects projects doing that. I think a pocket dot, right? I think right. dot is the one who's trying to solve this problem. Yes. We're we're not. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk mm-hmm. about your innovations now. Uh, fast consensus. Let's talk about your consensus algorithms and, and and your instant finality as well. How are you going to achieve this instant finality? You and what kind of consensus are you using? Yeah, I think the one we we we, we have is for now is our depots, mm-hmm. randomized uh, depots. So the idea is <clears throat> very close to depots. I think everyone maybe understand how depots works, right? Basically you have like a fixed number of delegates and each time interval, one delegate just generate one block. Uh, I think the thing like we are different from depots is uh, there are two, two differences. First, like uh, who are the delegates? Basically we want to randomize the set of delegates. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, we were maybe, so that's why we have this VIF, verified random, random uh, verifiable random function to select yes. maybe a small random com- uh, committee uh, out of all the delegates. And then we just do the consensus within this small random group. And then the next round, uh, we will just select another random group in a non-reactive way. So okay. that's that's the first. Uh, the second difference is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> once like one block has been generated by one delegate, we want to do a PBFT kind of uh, consensus among all the delegates within this small group. 
right? So basically, that's how the instant finality can be achieved. If like all they can just agree on the newly created block, then this block becomes final and will be appended to the blockchain. I see. So obviously, the integration of quite innovative consensus models is going to be advantageous to you. Let's talk about, uh, I guess, your, your flexibility in terms of being lightweight as well. That's one of the things that you mentioned previously. How is it that you're going to establish this idea of being a lightweight uh, architecture? Yeah, so that's why I think we introduced lots of uh, primitives from the lightweight cryptography space. Mm -hmm. uh, there are definitely, uh, this, this server has been there for like uh, at least 10 years. Uh, there are some very uh, de uh, delicate design mm -hmm. to make like a certain operations more lightweight than others. So that's why I, I think that's that's basically my research background. I We're see. trying to form something from that field and put it into the blockchain space. Okay. And what about in terms of your ring, ring, ring signatures? You know, can you tell us a bit, a bit more about your design there and, and how you're going about you know, integrating mm -hmm. that into your root chain? Yeah, like a ring signature is basically trying to hide who's sending the money, who's sending the token, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in terms of that, I think there are like, like a, three categories of technology. One is called um, multi-party uh, computation, which I think that some projects work on that. Yes. Another one is called ZK Snark. They're they're knowledge proof. I think Zcash is a is a big name over there. And the third one is the ring signature. Basically, crypto node and Monero use this technology. Right. But the limitation they have is like the signature size is linear to how many mixings they have. So that's the thing we want to improve because you you want like uh, maybe a larger anonymity set, meaning like uh, maybe a larger number of people who gets just mixed into this transaction. Right. At the same time, you want the signature size to be as small as possible. Um, so so here is the innovation we have. Basically, uh, we have like one guy who's a really... Uh, also uh, working with me on the cryptography, mm -hmm. uh, trying to optimize the ring signature in a way so that we can have this uh, ring signature size to be to be really small. Okay, and, and it's yeah. constantly so, from my understanding, is it's a constantly small size ring ring signature. Yeah, so we're we're having some discussion about this uh, constant size versus logarithm size of the signature size. There are some compromise. Uh, there are some trade-offs in terms of design. If you really want to make this ring signature constant size, uh, there are some compromise we have to to to, to take. So I that's see. why we're still like a uh, yeah uh, like trying to evaluate evaluate to doing more experiment on like right. which one we which way we want to go. Well, down. given that uh, so many prominent <clears throat> blockchains, I'll, I'll name one. That's one chain. They are also using much of the Monero style ring, ring, ring signature. It's exciting to hear that you are evolving and developing the very nature of ring signatures as well. If you could also talk about other things that are in your white paper, one of them is your range proof using bulletproofs as well. How is that mm -hmm. relevant? How does that work in, time, in terms of your root chain as well? Yeah, I think bulletproof is just trying to hide the amount. Like there are three things we want to hide. The sender, the receiver, the amount. Bulletproof is basically give you a range proof, um, trying to hide how, how much you have been sent from A to B, right? right. So I think a bulletproof compared to the previous, like a, uh, Paris commitment, it means like it has a smaller uh, proof size. So that's why we also want to integrate with uh, Bulletproof. Actually, we have the, some conversations uh, ongoing with the Bulletproof team. Right. Um, they are, yeah, they already have this implementation. So basically, we are trying to um, I see. To so what, what's exciting is that you're really focused on all the different components of privacy. You're, like, you're really going deep into that, I can see. If you could tell us a bit more about your use cases with regard to lightweight smart contracts, how are the smart contracts going to relate to your plan? So in terms of smart contract, on the, on the root chain, I think the plans do not have smart contract because it's not needed. The root chain is meant to be like a simple, stable, mm -hmm. and scalable. Okay. And for the side chains, side chains can have different forms, right? Like one form maybe is more like Ethereum alike. Maybe one form is more like I, I don't even know. Maybe DAG structure. I, I I have no idea. So maybe some 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 uh, some side chain have this smart contract running on top of that. So we want to optimize a smart contract in a way to make it like very lightweight because we notice like IoT devices they are usually just built for one or two purposes. It's not a computer. It's just for maybe, for example, just sensor the environment, sensor the temperature. So it's just for, for doing one or two things. So that's why like a smart contract can be more tailored, right? Just can be just doing something very specific rather than doing everything. I so see. that's idea there. 
Yeah, but we haven't started that part of work yet. Uh, we are for now. We are focused most focusing focused on the uh, testnet scalability and privacy. Sure, but it is exciting to know that that is in part of your roadmap that yeah. you will be looking at that because smart contracts are, are a huge industry in themselves. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to also ask you now about your team. I have to say, having looked through your team, I was really impressed. There was significant <coughs> number of PhDs listed with your your team. Uh, just alone with, uh, for example, some names of Shish, uh, Xin Xing Fan or Jing Sung, Tim Pan, Dustin, and Kevin. Or I'm sorry, I pronounced some of those names wrong. But clearly, there's there's endless PhDs there. So I guess I wanted to ask you just how important is it that the your team be so well skilled and well versed in the, each of their skill sets? Yeah, yeah. I feel like they are all top experts in their own uh, fields. Yeah, for example, uh, my, my, my co-founder, uh, Kevin, like he's a PhD in the computer vision and uh, <clears throat> machine learning, and he has like this really rich ex experience about system, about the products, because he's doing lots of things at uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. he was doing, right? And also in terms of Xinxin, uh, he has been doing this cryptography for more, more than, I don't know, even know, like 15 years or even more has like a, uh, 40 plus publications, lots of patterns, okay. especially in the in the lightweight crypto uh, crypto space, and also this Dustin. Uh, Dustin is coming from Intel. He has been doing this uh, dis distribute system, some Linux kernel stuff, also for lots of years. So I right. think like this is a very good team with like people with different skill set, like they can compensate for each other, um, but entirely they have like this uh, very needed skill set to 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 really build something that is useful absolutely and impactful. And, and as yeah. I said before it was a very impressive team did you was it mm -hmm. was it something that organically evolved or did you go and seek out some of these uh, you know members of the te of, of your team yeah for like this core members of the team like uh, uh, even I maybe I or maybe Kevin has known them for many years so we're not just like team up in like one or two months and trying something really rush right, right. so it's kind of well planned. Like we had have this conversation from, I would say, even from several years back, I see. saying like we want to do something very meaningful for the blockchain. So in that yeah. respect, Rowland, how long has it been in operation, your actual project, in from the from its fruition? Yeah, like I said, the conversation has started like a few years back. We're just trying to figure out um, like what we want really, right? Mm -hmm. Then <clears throat> I, I think it, it's. Uh, last year around April, basically we kick off the project uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. Like we look into the implementation, we look at different approach. We are trying to engage people with skill sets because we want to have a powerful team down the road. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think it's roughly it's roughly maybe ten months starting from last year optical. Uh, so you've, you've achieved a lot in such a small amount of time. And I wanted to ask you now yeah. about your advisors. You have three advisors listed on your website. All three mm -hmm. of them are extremely impressive. You have Fan, Jack and Gwang. You know, clearly they're powerful people in their own right. How important has it been from your experience to have these kinds of this kind of level of advisorship? Oh yeah, so advisor, yeah, they are. Re they have been like really helpful and also really supportive to us. For example, like my PhD advisor, Professor Gong, mm -hmm. she's a really uh, nice lady, and she's also very strong in academic. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's giving us like lots of support in terms of cryptography, in terms of uh, like blockchain technology, right? And also RFID, the IoT stuff. Right. And Jack Lee, Jack Lee is more like a <clears throat> from industry side, so. Uh, I think he, he he's from a fund which is basically focusing on technology in China. Which is so huge. that's why he that's absolutely huge. huge. Mm. Yeah, that's why like he has lots lots of connections with different hardware manufacturer, IoT vendors mm -hmm. in China, here, everywhere. So he has also like a very very great eye, very yes. great eye. I have to yeah thank him. And also Fan Fan is from like an investor background, so he. He has been giving advice to us, like how to run the company, how to do the right thing at the right time, that kind of thing. Also, very, very good strategies. Yeah, awesome. are many good strategies from him. So it That's seems awesome. you really thought about the different needs uh, and and allowed the advisors to cater for those needs. And and clearly, you know, you've sought out the best of the 
the best you can find. Let's talk about your partners now. Some of them I, I haven't actually seen before. You know, LKK, Hoffman, Trust Look. How, how important are these partners and have you really thought about the kind of partnerships? Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think they are mostly from the uh, IoT space, right? For example, this Hoffman, mm -hmm. it, it's basically a very big, uh, how to say, like a, like a group company in China. They are doing lots of smart home hardwares, like routers, thermostats, speakers, lots of things. Okay. So by, by, in, by like partnership, by partnering with them, basically we are getting lots of opportunities to be exposed to how can we maybe integrate our solutions into their hardware uh, devices. I see. Yeah. So obviously mm -hmm. they're, they're very valuable as strategic partners. What about your investors? Yeah. You have an endless number of investors already in your project. So clearly you've had a lot of backing. Right. So we are trying to spread out the investment from the different investors. I, I think there are maybe three criteria uh, for selecting the investors. The first one is like we want the investors to have a strong connection in the blockchain world, right? So they have been like in the blockchain for a while. They understand they have the mind, right mindset of doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And secondly is like we want the investors to have some maybe IoT background which will help us to connect with real IoT vendors and manufacturers. Right. And third but not least is like some uh, investors, they have this global community. For example, this hash in career. So basically it's ha they have a very strong community in career. So that's why I, we, we think, uh, because it's a go global chain company, this is a global company. So we, we want like have global community. And have global out. reach as well, no doubt. So you, yeah. again, it's, it's really considered Every aspect, it seems, of your whole plan has been really well thought out. Let's talk about your token now for a moment, Rowland. Um, in terms of the distribution model itself, you know, how have you thought about the, the, I guess, the ratios of distribution so that you do cater for R&D in the future and also for your team? Um, I don't want to disclose the allocation for now, but I, I guess we will have something, some news updated on the, maybe on the Telegram channel maybe on the website. I don't so, have the concrete number for now, to be right. honest. Okay, so just to be clear on yeah. that, are you, are, you, are you referencing how you plan to allocate and design your token distribution? Are you saying that you don't know that yet? Uh, so actually... Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm only asking you so that the audience are understanding how you plan to mm -hmm. sustain your R&D in the future. Because as you'd appreciate, almost oh. every great project allocates some aspect of their token design to oh i see i see okay maybe i misunderstood your question so yeah so we reserve like a 15 uh, percent of the token for the team for the foundation yep so which will be uh, which will be hiring like a, a talented people for doing the r and d sure yes. okay mm -hmm. and what about your team have you allocated an aspect of that for your team yeah that's that's within this 15 percent okay yeah so much of it's designed for the public uh, no, we also reserve something for the for the foundation because to run the foundation, uh, especially to engage with like the IoT companies, IoT ventures, IoT communities, we need some we need some capital over there. So I would say like it's roughly thirty percent something we want reserved for the community and also the ecosystem. Okay. Okay. So you're again about sustaining it for the long term. Let's talk about your I I yeah. ICO now. That's an important thing for many of the audience. They want to know how that's going and what the plan is. I know you don't want to talk too much about it. So what can you tell us? Yeah. Uh, what I can uh, what I can disclose like we finished the pre sale, and we um, I think it's twenty four percent of token has been sold to institutional investors as listed on our website. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're we're thinking about like a public sale, but we don't have a concrete plan for now. We're sorting out the details. So just stay tuned. I, I really don't have this information. For yes, now. well, I appreciate your honesty on that. And let's talk about now your roadmap as well, Rowland. What uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's some three key things I've written down in April, October, and November for you, uh, with your testnet, mainnet, and also your, there's some SDK news coming out in November. That's exciting in itself. So for you, what are some of the big things coming for 2018? Yeah, I think in 2019, well, it's going to be like our privacy year. We are going to do like a so focus on the privacy technology mm -hmm. for blockchain because for now, all the privacy technology for, for blockchain 
are so heavyweight that makes like IoT devices not work. Right. right. So basically, we want to have some like a very innovative privacy, like even something in, embedded into the hardware to make this work. Sure. So yeah. just in terms of this year, though, if we could talk about it, April testnet. Mm -hmm. Are you excited about that? That's quite soon. I'm ex both excited and also very stressful about that because that keeps like keeps the entire the entire team up at night, right? Uh, we are trying very hard to 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 finish the testnet uh, so, preview, which was going to be released on maybe April. Okay, so how are you going in terms of your schedule? Are you feeling confident you'll make it in April? Yeah, this schedule is very, uh, we, we have a very aggressive schedule actually, to be honest, mm -hmm. but we're trying to make it happen. Awesome. In October, your mm -hmm. mainnet launch? You know that must be yeah, exciting. Yeah, we, 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 are, we are thinking about that. We want, uh, we want to have the mainnet launch. That's, that's great because obviously, mm -hmm. you know, some of the great projects we see, they have both their, their test nets and main nets planned well and truly within the scope of the year. Um, we've, brought, we've also talked about some of your, you know, other projects coming out. Um, IO, IO, IOTA is one I wanted to broach with you with their Tangle protocol and also the DAGs. How do you feel about, you know, other protocols like Tangle and DAGs coming in with their um, directed acyclic graphs? And they are obviously, you know, their own technologies. What do you think of those those innovations? Yeah, I think they're cool. Actually, I I, I kind of like the idea. Uh, although there are some problems, it's quite new. There are some challenges, but this seems like a, a good uh, direction to explore. So so I like it. Yeah. Awesome. And just in terms uh -huh. of access now, if we could talk, if you wanted to direct us to different social media platforms that really showcase what IoTex is all about, where could we go? Uh, social net, uh, social network, right? So yeah. mostly we're on the Telegram group, and we have people just keep the group running in an organic way. Okay. And also, uh, I think we have a technical uh, blog, blog post on the on the medium.com. So that's where you can find more information. And also, guys, if you're not uh, familiar with the website itself, it's io iotex.io, which is a great way to get information as well. Um, I certainly went there very quickly to understand more about you. Now, in terms of future endeavors, let's talk about these aspects of research, partners, teams of the future. I know you can't disclose too much and you certainly won't. I can tell if, you, you know, if it's something that isn't signed <laughs> with you. But <laughs> just in terms of partners of the, of the future, what are you thinking and where are you going? Uh, yeah, I think partners, we're, we're, uh, there are maybe three categories of partners. I think one is some academic research labs. Basically, we want to engage with um, because they are doing something really cool in terms of privacy, in terms of like this cryptography technology, right. which would take blockchain to the next level. So that's that's one we're working on. And another one is like this IoT, also maybe hardware companies. Uh, there are one or two, uh, we, which will be announced maybe later this year. Like we are trying to go into incorporate with them, trying to not incorporate, cooperate with them to have this. Uh, uh, like our first or maybe second the app uh, to get uh, built on top of IOTX blockchain also together with their hardware. I see. <clears throat> yeah. I see. So. And also the yeah, okay. and also the third one is like we want also work with some open source IoT uh, softwares, for example, operation systems, right? And and trying to basically embed it maybe our stuff into like the more open source software as well. So like that's. That makes it easier for, uh, to adopt like uh, IoTX technology for open source projects as well. Right. So, and what about team? Mm -hmm. Have you got any uh, expansion plans or, or plans to expand rather the team? Yeah, like the thing that keeps keeps me most mostly uh, exhausted is trying to hire more people, especially great people, right? Like we got lots of applicants, but like my and also my my coworker. Like their job is trying to pick the top talent from Silicon Valley, from like here or maybe even in China. Um, like the top talents, we want to hire top talents in terms of engineering, in terms of cartography. Right. And we're going to expand the team. I don't have a concrete number, but I plan to expand the team to roughly maybe 16 people by end of this, this year. So, Rowan, if someone was listening that was experienced in cryptography or perhaps you know is currently doing a PhD, what would you say to them? You know, if you know, they wanted to explore, you know, employment with you. Yeah, yeah. Just send an email to support at iotex.io, um, and we're really, we will be really uh, excited to talk with you. 
Awesome. Well, it's been an mm -hmm. absolute privilege to speak with you, Rowland Chai. You are the co-founder of IOTEX, a very exciting IoT-related blockchain project for 2018 and beyond. Yeah, I've learned so much. You are a robust team. Uh, you, you come with a lot of experience. So thank you very much for your time. Is there anything that you wanted to finally add? Uh, no, I, I think we're all good. Thank you. Also, thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you very much for your time, Rowan.